Thank you very much, Wallace, for that kind introduction. We won't talk about the Scottish rugby team. Thank you, Lords, ladies and gentlemen, for allowing me to stand before you and speak today. Um, thank you. Uh, start with a few more thank yous. Thank you to the South of England Agricultural Society who kindly sponsored my, my Nuffield scholarship. Thank you to Mike and the team at the Nuffield Trust, keeping us uh, cajoled and heading in the right direction and ensuring that we do what we do when we should do it. Uh, my, fa my family, my highly tolerant wife who puts up with me for God knows what reason, but uh, she does, and my team at home uh, who didn't seem to notice I was gone. <laughs> so what is financial resilience? I've defined it as the uh, ability of a business to withstand long periods of low returns in a sector caused by whatever means. So my study centers on building financial resilience uh, and, looking at, uh, and looking at ways to ensure good returns year after year. Now that is, as far as I can see, the panacea of agriculture. We're exposed to huge volatility uh, in our industry and it doesn't matter what sector you're in, uh, you'll, you'll be exposed to, to, to volatility. And in my, in my study, I went to uh, New Zealand, to Australia, to the US, all over Europe, looking at different ways, different businesses, and how they've all managed to look at ways to combat uh, volatility and to try and help even out, iron out, improve the financial resilience of their businesses. So in my report, uh, I use the analogy of um, a triathlete. Uh, so a triathlete has to be good at all disciplines in order to stand a chance of winning the race. It's no good uh, being a great runner or a great swimmer um, if you can't finish the cycle ride in a competitive time. And so rather like the triathlete, a business owner needs to be good at a range of disciplines in order to run a truly resilient business. So here's our anti-hero. Here he is. I've met him a few times throughout my life. He wants to take part in the triathlon, but he's a bit flabby. He's not very competitive. He hasn't got the right equipment and he hasn't trained hard enough. But he's a decent bloke and he wants to give it a go. And he's keen to get better at what he does. So to set the scene, I, met, uh, I decided to start my study by meeting three highly prominent uh, economists. Um, some operate in the, in, the, uh, in the poultry industry and some just general economists. One, Sean Rickard, everyone knows Sean Rickard. He's a little bit uh, controversial at times, but you can't help but understand, I certainly get his messages. <laughs> Peter Van Horn of Wageningen Wagen University in Holland, and Nan Dirk Mulder, who's the chief, economist, chief poultry economist at Rabobank. So, in a world uh, where we're projected to have um, you know, 9 billion people by 2050, um, does free range have a position at all? Does high welfare... Uh, production have a, have a place at all? Well, actually, yes, it does. If a market exists, it's us, us as producers, it's our responsibility to fulfill that market. If it's there, we fulfill it. It's not down to us to decide uh, the direction uh, or what people should be eating. If they want to eat something, we produce it. Anyway, if Maeve gets away uh, and uh, does her job, uh, I think with the reduction in waste, we'll get some way to feeding those 9 billion people. Where is the UK in the Global Cost of Production League? Uh, well, I can tell you we're, we're, we're somewhere near the top. It's not a, not a league you want to be at the top of because we are one of the highest cost producers uh, in the world. Um, because, um, uh, because of our uh, lion codes, because of our um, freedom foods, because of our European legislation that is uh, highly regulated in this country, um, we're actually 15% higher cost of production than, than much of Europe, let alone the likes of Brazil or India or the US. And how do we build resilience? Um, is the quest to reduce the effects of volatility a folly? Well, I don't think, that, I don't think it is, not from what I've found. Um, and where are the opportunities? Where are the opportunities for us? So here we are at the beginning of the race. The cycle ride, I call this. So we can, we can all, every business owner, can get stuck in to all of these things now. You don't need to wait for someone to give you a hand. You don't need to wait for someone to give you a handout. 
you can just crack on. So, first of all, you need to find out your business. Are you in the top 25% in your sector? Do you actually know? The first job of any business is to know your costs, to understand your numbers, to see where you are in the league tables. Every, business, every, every, um, every industry can, uh, has benchmarking figures that one can use. The free range egg industry has a great set of figures that are published every month in the Ranger magazine. Set KPIs, key performance indicators. Set, set yourself some targets. And then monitor against those targets. Am I achieving those targets? Why am I not achieving those targets? And work on your weaknesses. Everybody has weaknesses. So you can think, if you think you've got the best business, forget it, you haven't. Get somebody else in there to have a look for you. Pat yourself on the back. There's nothing wrong with patting yourself on the back with your successes, but you do need to understand your weaknesses and work on them. Adopt a culture of, uh, of continual improvement within your business. Now, this is an area that I spent a lot of, a lot of time on, um, looking at different, different industries and different techniques, uh, not just agriculture, but, but way beyond. Um, I didn't actually manage to get to speak to Dave Brailsford uh, of Team Sky, but he's taken the, um, he's taken the, uh, the, 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 the benefits of marginal gain to a, to a different level. The Sky Team cycling team uh, are, are the best in the world, and the reason they're the best in the world is because they look at every tiny detail of what they're doing and improve it, and try and improve it. They're looking at power-to-weight ratios of, of cyclists, more slippery clothing. They're looking at... Uh, tiny changes in tyre pressures, all of these things to get an edge. I was also very lucky um, to, uh, to get into um, the Williams F1 factory, um, where, where you see um, uh, tiny, uh, intricate parts that they were making out of whole blocks of aluminium, all to get a tenth, hundredth of a second um, benefit over their competitors. And the level of attention to detail was quite extraordinary. I was very lucky while I was there also to meet um, Massa and Bottas. Sorry, I've, got, I've covered Bottas's face there. Um, I was going to put the selfie on, but it was such a shocking photo uh, that, that I decided to put the picture up of someone taking a picture of me taking a selfie. Um, the, the most disturbing thing about that picture uh, was, first of all, I tried to get in the car, wouldn't fit. Uh, and secondly, that Massa is actually exactly half my weight. So the swim, I spend a lot of time in my report talking about the swim. So the swim, when you're swimming, there's a lot more resistance and uh, it's a lot more difficult. You don't cover as much ground for the effort that you put in or the effort that, that's exerted. And I uh, talk about um, things like legislation, government interference, uh, all of that sort of thing within this chapter. So working with government can seem a little bit like swimming bit of resistance, do they really want to help, you know? Um, could also be described as running through treacle or watching me run across a rugby pitch. Um, and it can be hard work, but, you know, Winston Churchill said that uh, democratic government is the, is the worst type of government, <clears throat> except all the others that have been tried from time to time, i.e. it's pretty rubbish and it's difficult to get change, but it's the best of a bad bunch. Now, I went to spend a lot of time in the States talking to, um, I was very, I, I've never made it a secret that I'm dead against direct subsidies. I think it keeps inefficient people in business. You can shoot me afterwards. Uh, and, uh, but I th and I think there needs to be a fundamental change in the subsidy system in this country. In America, it feels much better because they have a insurance schemes. So people buy into them, they kind of buy into the scheme. You can decide the level of risk that you, that you take. And I feel that uh, for the UK, that would be a much more appropriate way to help us um, balance times of, of volatility and, and, and balance farm incomes. Tax averaging. Now, it's pretty obvious that the government have been keeping a close eye on me throughout my Nuffield study, because I was just about to, or uh, well, I had just put a recommendation in my report about tax averaging over a long, longer period of time, so that as farms make you know, large profits, and it does happen, it does happen that farms do make large profits, but of course, they, as we know, they also make low profits too. And if we can uh, average the tax out over a longer period of time, that, will, uh, that, that can help a farmer's cash flow. Uh, all too often, farmers go out and buy a new tractor 
in a high tax year, spend all the cash, and then when they've got to pay the tax, a couple of years later, or a year and a bit later, uh, the money's not in the bank. It's busy depreciating in the yard. But anyway, the government announced that as a, uh, as a, um, as a, as a recommendation fairly recently, so they were obviously watching me. Deposit schemes in Australia. In Australia, they have a great scheme uh, called the Farm Management Deposit Scheme, and uh, where in, in, in high-income um, high years, they can put money away into a tax-free savings account, um, and then that money can be drawn upon in, low, in years of low incomes. Now, to me, again, it's so blindingly obvious that we need a scheme like that in the UK to, again, in the high profit years, put that money away, leave it safe. It's not going to get taxed. You even get a tiny little bit of interest on it. And then you can drag that money out when you're not making any profit. Seems a much more sensible approach than buying shiny new tractors. And, of course, we need a fair trading environment. Never, never, never has it been more important... To, to, get, to get a fair trading environment in the light of Brexit. I sat with Mike Skews, uh, Secretary of Agriculture in the USDA, and he said that he reckoned his, his opinion of uh, the, the TTIP, Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, was that uh, uh, the, the UK could leave Europe, uh, negotiate its own agreement with the US, and have a great uh, um, bilateral agreement with the US before the Europeans had even woken up and worked out what was going on. And I actually, when you look at it, I agree. So the run. This, this is a bit more difficult. This, is, uh, this takes a bit more time, a bit more effort. Um, but uh, it's all the things that one can build in one's business. Now, probity, probity, honesty. Be reliable, be honest, be open. If you've got a problem in your business, talk to people. Tell them. They can help. If they don't know, they can't help you. I know from my own personal experiences that uh, building up trust in the supply chain, it, it really does work. work. Compliance. Be compliant. We've got our lovely assurance schemes within the poultry industry. We've got more than most. We get auditors all the time. And I have a, uh, an edict in our company that's 100% compliant 100% of the time. So anybody can come to any one of my farms at any time and know that, uh, that we're complying. Output value protection, well, there's not a great deal we can do about output value protection. We can, we, can, we, can, we can influence how much we produce, but we can't generally influence how much we get paid for it. Cost price protection, we can do quite a bit more. Um, there's futures we can buy. There's interesting new products in the UK designed by one of our fellow Nuffield scholars that Sadly, I ran out of time, couldn't spend any time with him to, to, to look at it. But there are ways that one can, can, um, can manage the, the value of your, your costs, or your costs, rather, sorry. And integration. Integration can uh, add um, protection into your business. The more of the supply chain you control, the more uh, influence you have over the profitability of your business. And every layer of integration can, and I put it in capital letters, add margin to your bottom line. But only if your core operation is working properly. So, I went to Indonesia and, uh, because I'd heard that there were some very good, big, large agribusinesses in Indonesia. And when I was dropped off at uh, Melbourne Airport by one of my fellow Australian Nuffielders, he put that on Facebook. Is this the oldest and fattest backpacker in the world? Yes. It's meant to be a nice family community, this Snuffield. Anyway, so there's lots one can do to make your business more resilient. Protect your, protect your output. Concentrate on your costs. Attention to detail. You can make a difference. Government can help, but don't rely on it. So take home messages. There is no excuse not to try and continually improve one's, one's business. Every day, ask yourself, what can I do to make life better today? The UK egg, free range egg production uh, has a bright future as long as we as producers know our costs, benchmark against others and strive to be in that top 25% lowest cost producer. That we strive for the very best health and welfare standards that the industry continues to build and maintain trust in its products with consumers. Without our consumers, we've got nothing. And there is a lot more that government can do to help, 
but don't rely on it. And what you should do, and it should be, it should be any government intervention should be centred around making the industry a lot more resilient and a lot less reliant. And if you are to integrate, do it with extreme caution. Now here's our anti-hero again. He didn't take any notice of what I said. So he came last in the race and he got the wooden spoon. But he's determined now he's going to go out and read my report and he's going to heed what it says and the next time he goes out, he's going to be more like one of these two. And you can have a gold medal winning business too. Thank you very much.